OK, so very long instruction words processors still want to have high performance. And we took all this hardware that was in a out of order super scale and we sort of threw it out. Well, something's got to make up for it. And what makes up for it is a very, very, very smart compiler. So we put a lot of emphasis on the compiler in these sorts of architectures. And the, the compiler really has to do the scheduling. It has to do all of the uh, dependency checking. It, it um, probably has to avoid all the different data hazards. And this is just sort of just getting started. We're going to talk um, mostly next lecture about all of the different optimizations that a compiler can do to try to approximate what a out of order superscaler can do, but by doing it statically. So it's a pretty cool trick. If you take all that hardware, you put it in the compiler, you run it once, and then every time you go to execute the code, you don't have to go and recalculate all the dependencies. Sounds good. OK, so let's see how we execute some code here and what is the sort of performance aspects to executing loop code on a very long instruction word processor. So here we have a very basic array um, increment. We're going to take every element of this array. We're going to increment it by the value c. <coughs> On our, we run it through our compiler, and here's a sequential code sequence. This has not been scheduled yet for VLIWs, or for our VLIW architecture over here. So we load some, we, we load the value, we increment our counters, we actually do the floating point add, we store the value back, we uh, increment the uh, array index, and then we, we loop. Seems simple enough. Let's see how this gets scheduled here. Well, the, because the architecture and because the compiler knows about the latencies here, let's say this load here has a few cycles of latency. So it's going to actually schedule this add later. And the add, it's a floating point add. This has a couple of cycles of latency also. So it schedules the consumer. Uh, of that result here, this F2, later. <clears throat> and yeah, I don't know, it can sprinkle in the array uh, additions and the counter additions kind of somewhere free. It has lots of open slots. But let's say it schedules it at the same time as the load in the store. So this is pretty cool. We are actually executing two wide parallelism here. And we didn't need all the extra overhead of uh, uh, in-order superscalar. Oh, and we can even schedule the branch somewhere. OK, so first question here, how many floating point operations are we doing per cycle? Are we doing very well here? This looks, looks, looks pretty poor. We have one floating point operation here, just this add. And we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight cycles. Yeah. So we're having 0.18 or, or 0.125 floating, floating point operations per cycle. Uh, it's not that great. We, we do have some parallelism. You know, we're executing three instructions here. It's better than nothing, but we're, we're not really using the machine very well. Our out of order superscalar would probably try to uh, take instructions that are below here, maybe intermix them, try to reorder a bunch of things, and try to run faster. So what's the technique to go faster? Well, one of the big compile as I said, uh, we have a lot of emphasis on compilers in this unit. One of the things the compiler can do is it can actually unroll the loop. So here we have our loop. We unroll it four times. And now we're going to sort of take the loop overhead, and we're going to factor it out so that it only happens once every four times. Ooh, that sounds good. We're probably going to do some more work here per each iteration of the loop. Um, but things get a little more complicated. What happens here if n, big uppercase n here, are uh, terminating value is not a multiple of four. Well, we need to do something about that. We probably need to check sort of before we go to execute here 
whether we're, we're doing OK or whether we actually are multiple four. Conveniently, if n is big enough, we probably can run as a multiple four for a long period of time. And, and it's only the last iteration that we have to clean up. But we need to generate some cleanup code. And the compiler is responsible to do this. So these compiler uh, optimizations do take some effort. OK, so let's look at the scheduling now of our loop unrolled code. We can do a bunch of loads up front here. So we've inter intermingled these loops. And what's kind of cool is we can actually pull out the loads and sort of throw them to the top and the stores and push them to the bottom. And then put all the adds sort of in the middle and maybe sprinkle uh, the array updates somewhere else. And when we go to actually schedule that, we're going to do something similar. We're going to have the loads executing first. Execute the floating point adds, have the floating point stores, and have the result. But what you can notice here is we're actually starting to get some overlap. Because we've unrolled, we can overlap this load and the first floating point addition. Because we've effectively covered the latency of our functional units by putting other loop iterations during that time. So if you look at this schedule versus the schedule back here, we've just sort of taken these dead cycles and we've put the other loop iterations in those dead cycles. In this loop unrolled case, we're incrementing these counters and the indexes not by four anymore. We're incrementing by however many times we've loop unrolled times the offset. So we're incrementing it by 16 now. Does that make sense? Because in, in this code here, we were incrementing R2 by 4, because that's um, the size of a single value is 4 bytes. So we have to sort of move our array index over by 4. But now, because we're batching up all this work together, <coughs> We actually have to move the uh, index by a, a bigger value. So we're moving it by four, because we've unrolled four times, times the size of the data value, which was four. So we're moving it by 16. And, and one of the nice things here, if you look, is in both the lows and the stores, we're using our um, register indirect addressing mode here to add in some offset. So we're actually offsetting, let's say, 12 plus this base register of R1 to figure out where we're actually doing the load from. But it's just a, a convenient way that we don't have to compute a bunch of addresses. <clears throat> OK, so going back here, we can see we're starting to overlap uh, actual operations with other loop iterations. Well, that's really cool. So we're starting to get some uh, performance here. So let's, let's look at the performance. So we'll ask the same question here. How many floating point operations per cycle? Well, hopefully, hopefully it's higher. One, two, three, four. And divided by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven cycles. OK, so that's point, point 0.36 is a lot better than point 0.125. So this is good. Loop unrolling is helping us. But is this, is this everything, or can we do more in our compiler? So the, the smart compiler people came up with even a better, uh, fancier idea, which is called software pipelining. So it uses, uses a term we've seen before, pipelining but does it in software. So the idea here is that instead of just having one loop, unrolling the loop, and then overlapping the iterations, we're actually going to take multiple of these schedules and interleave them. And try to fill some of these empty slots. So let's, let's look at this. We're going to have. The code unrolled four times. This is the same piece of code we had on the previous slide. And we're going to draw our schedule that we had before. So here's the schedule we had before in purple. 
Okay, that doesn't look so bad. But now we're going to schedule it with another iteration of the exact same four time unrolled loop, shown here in green. So we've just overlapped this with this other um, iteration of the loop. Well, are we, are we done here? Well, not quite. We still have some open slots here. So let's try to overlap even another iteration, as shown here in red. Now, the fix-up code that you need to have to do this uh, correctly gets more complex. Because all of a sudden now, you're basically overlapping multiple iterations. But as long as you don't modify some value, as long as you don't do a store speculatively, or a store, you're probably OK. Because otherwise, you're just doing loads. You're doing extra loads, doing extra work. You're doing extra work, and you're filling slots thinking that you're not going to have anything go wrong, or thinking that the uh, index variable n, if you will, is uh, multiple of 4 and large, and you're not at the end. So let's, let's put some names to these things. <clears throat> so we call the beginning here the run-up, the prologue. Here we actually have our sort of actual iteration. You can see that the, uh, sorry, this is in green. That doesn't show up very well. Uh, there are instructions here. There's ads. It's pretty full. We're actually doing a lot of work on our VLIW machine here. And then the epilogue here is, the, is when we're done. This is when we're falling out. Um, we're sort of at the, the last loop iteration of the outer loop, if you will. So let's, let's do some math and look at the performance of this. OK, so that's the same question here. How many floating point operations per cycle? Well, we go look over here. We have one, two, three, four. And we have four cycles in our, in our tight loop case. That looks pretty good. That's cool. We just got a bunch of performance. But we had to do a lot of compiler optimization to make this work. But we were able to use the parallels in the machine, and we were able to overlap three different iterations of this loop that we also did a software transform to unroll it four times. So this is called uh, software pipelining. And I have a nice picture here to sort of show what's going on visually. So we're going to have time on the horizontal axis, and we'll have sort of activity of how many instructions are executing or something like that on the vertical axis, or, or shown here as performance. When you run multiple loop unrolled iterations, you have sort of some startup. You have the actual, uh, you're running the loop, and then you uh, come down from that. And that's, that's better than uh, having a lot of startup and sort of come down with a very small loop iteration portion here in the middle. <clears throat> but when we go to look at software pipelined, we can overlap basically one iteration of loops uh, execution with, or one loops startup or, uh, uh, with the loop iteration of another loop. And we can actually execute sort of our prologue, execute multiple iterations, very tight, and then have our epilogue here. Yeah. So our software pipelining, we're only paying the startup and wind down costs once for the execution of a loop and not every iteration of the loop. So that's, that's, that's fun. That's cool. We're getting performance. Only the world was dense loops. Life would be easy. Alas, the world is not all loops. If we just had a processor which just did dense array calculations, and all of our problems in the world were just dense array computations, life would be really easy. But they're not. A lot of times, code has lots of branches. It has if-then-else clauses. And here, we sort of graphically show something like a uh, if-then-else. So 
we have some piece of code, it makes a decision. It either executes the code on the left or executes the code on the right based on uh, an if statement. So this is the if true statement and this is the else clause. <clears throat> and data dependent branches are a problem typically for very long instruction word processors. Now why is that? Hmm. Well, in an out-of-order processor, you can try to execute code sort of around the branches and move instructions above the branch and below the branch. But if you're doing static scheduling, when you hit this branch, and let's say it's a hard to predict branch, you can't really do anything because you've packed a bunch of instructions next to each other and they need to execute atomically. So it's not like you can like sort of move code up and down across that branch. The super scalar can do that because it has this instruction window, it has a bunch of techniques, uh, a bunch of hardware to be able to do that. But in our uh, VLAW processor, that's a problem. So I wanted to introduce a, 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 a compiler, an important compiler uh, nomenclature here, which is important for this class. It's called a basic block. So what is a basic block? Um, a basic block is a piece of code which has single entry and single exit. So this is a basic block. It has one entry and one exit. And why is single entry important? Well, if you j can jump into the middle of this piece of code, the compiler cannot necessarily reorder the instructions inside this block. And if you have multiple exits, and say so you exit here, the compiler can't push instructions below that exit point. But if you have a basic block, the compiler basically knows that these, this instruction sequence is going to execute effectively effectively atomic, but not actually atomic. I mean, you can have other things going on inside there, but from a compiler perspective, it can reorder the instructions around in here to get better performance. Hmm. Okay. So loops. Loops are easy. We can solve for pipeline. We can unroll. Squirrely code, if then else, spaghetti code, a well, lot harder. So the compiler guys came up with some fancy tricks to make VLIWs work better and to take advantage of some of the code motion that an out of order superscaler does, but in the compiler and not in uh, dynamically in hardware. And um, one of the more famous ways to do this is something called trace scheduling, which was um, John Ellis's, who was one of uh, Josh Fisher's students' uh, thesis work. And this was in um, the Bulldog compiler out at Yale. So what you do is you profile the code. And you come up with the probabilities that these pr branches go the one way or the other way. So when I say profiling, this is not a, uh, something that the hardware is doing at runtime. This is something that you would do with the program while you're sort of still back in the compiler stage. You take the program, the compiler goes and runs it on some input given, or a given input set and comes up with probabilities of which way things go. And then what you do is you come up, you take this profile information and you come up with some guess at what is the most probable one. And we're going to circle that here and say these darkened edges are the most probable sort of path through this squirrely piece of code given this is the entry point. Now, this doesn't mean that you can't have branches that sort of branch out of this. But if you do, you need to have some fix-up code. Because what we're about to do is we're going to take this entire sort of big swath of code here. We're going to remove all of the branches. And we're going to schedule for our VLAW processor as one big monolithic uh, piece of chunk of code. And by doing this, we can move instructions, let's say, that are down here, which there's open slots to execute in the early portion of this uh, uh, code sequence. We can move them up. And likewise, you can move things that uh, use the result of long latency instructions up here and push it down across branches. So our out-of-order superscalar does this with branch speculation. But our compiler can do this on our VLAW processor using trace scheduling. But when we do this, we have to be careful 
Because there's always the possibility that, while unlikely, you can still branch the other way. So typically, the way this is done is you have some form of fix-up code that if you branch away, you have to sort of fix up anything that was after the branch that made a uh, uh, committed change, if you will, to the, the processor state. You need to sort of roll that back somehow. So we're basically in software doing the rollback case um, from our, our out of order super scalar. So instead of taking the architectural register file and copying it to the physical register file on um, branch mispredict, instead our compiler generates a code sequence which does that same operation if you were to branch away here. And we'll roll back only the, s only the certain registers that need to be rolled back and only the memory state that needs to be rolled back. So that's pretty cool is that we can basically take a lot of the functionality that was done in our out of our superscaler and put it into software using trace scheduling.